said these last couple of days, but who you've been uh, among us. And so we welcome you among us again this morning. I spent a long time trying to come to grips with my doubts until one day it dawned on me that I'd better come to grips with what I believe. I have since moved from the agony of trying to deal with questions that I cannot answer to the agony of dealing with answers that I cannot escape. And it's a great relief. What will happen by tonight if somebody said, will you say that again? <laughs> I want to write that down. <clears throat> but that's what it's all about. Now, we've been trying to put together what, what the frame of reference has to be if you're talking about being a revolutionary community. And we've been seeing that the most radical revolutionary ever to reveal himself to the human race is Jesus Christ. Radical in the sense that he gets to the root of where things are, revolutionary in the sense that he is ultimately involved in change. Now, the question again that always arises is, is it possible to produce this revolutionary community without Jesus? Is it possible to pull this thing off without Christ being the frame of reference? And my reply to that is very simple. It is possible to have an idealistic philosophy without Jesus. It is quite possible to have all of the ideals, theoretically, in your lifestyle that Jesus Christ lays down without Jesus Christ, but it is impossible to do it without Jesus Christ. It is quite possible to be idealistic mentally and theoretically and philosophically, but you'll never be able to pragmatically execute idealism without Jesus. Because he then becomes the power that pulls it off. Now, it is to help you to understand the lifestyle, excuse me, <clears throat> to help you understand the lifestyle that Jesus Christ wants to produce because someone keeps saying, well, look, how in the world are you going to produce this thing? How are we going to go out and produce this live community, this live model of what you're talking about? And my reply again is simply stop thinking about going out and producing a live community among 205 or 10 million Americans. The place to start is to start right here where you are, to produce a live model right here of the Augsburg community of what a Christian community is supposed to be. Not simply people walking around looking all pious, or people walking around with a bunch of rules and regulations in their pockets, but people who are bound together because they have a common frame of reference and because they are, they are committed to common goals and that they are fleshing out among themselves what's supposed to be. So it means very simple that a group of you sit down and say, do we want to produce this live model? Yes. What ought it to be like? And you write it down. These are the things that ought to exist if we're going to produce this live model. How do we produce it? Well, we must produce it through the power of Jesus Christ in our lives. How does that happen? And you work it out, and you become that model. So then when people want to know what's happening on earth the way it's happening in heaven, the word gets around, well, there is a group of people at the Augsburg community who are fleshing out on earth what's happening in heaven. And that's what you're talking about. You say, well, Tom, how does that relate to the system? Do we go in and try to change the system? Again, the answer is no. If, it, if the whole system lies in the hands of the demonic or the evil one, you cannot ultimately change it. But you can liberate people from it. You can change people's lifestyle from that of the system to the kingdom of God. I, best, I guess the best way to illustrate it then is to, is to go back to that, go back to the person of Jesus Christ himself and the institution of his own revolutionary community. And your exploration takes place in the fourth chapter of the book of Acts. Now, what has happened up to this point is that Jesus Christ has spent three years pouring himself essentially into 12 people. He had a public ministry. He talked to crowds of people, etc. But he spent most of his time with 12 guys because it was through them that he was going to produce these live models. The system hung him. <clears throat> he rises from the dead and he spends about... 
a month or so with his disciples, laying down the final ground rules for what they ought to do in the world. And then he cuts out. And what he tells them to do is that before you are to go out to produce these live models of what the kingdom of God is like on earth, I want you to get together and I want you to pray until you are saturated with the power of God because you are not going to be able to produce this lifestyle without my power. That is why it is futile if you are simply an idealist. It is futile if you're simply a humanitarian because you will not be able to flesh out the principles of the kingdom of God detached from the power of God. You and I do not have what it takes within ourselves to produce this live model of what God's doing in heaven on earth. And that's why Jesus says you are to wait until you are saturated, until you are endued with power. Until you have the dynamic and that word power is taken from the Greek word dynamis. It's the same word we use for dynamite. Until you are saturated with the dynamic of God. Now, and you know the story. These men become filled with the Spirit. They become actually, their lives become saturated with the lifestyle of Jesus Christ. Now what happens? Now what happens to a group of people who are filled with the dynamic of Jesus Christ? Now in the third chapter of Acts, an incident takes place where Peter and John are on their way up to pray to the temple. Keeping in mind that even when the disciples turned on to Jesus Christ, they did not abandon the synagogue. They didn't leave the synagogue. They didn't go stomping out the synagogue saying, now that we are trusting Jesus, we're leaving this thing. They, they went back and they continued to preach in the synagogues and pray in the synagogues till they got kicked out. Paul did that. Paul, even though he was turned on the Jesus Christ, every town he went to, the first place he made for was a synagogue. And he stood up and preached and preached and preached until they got angry and kicked him out. And they're on their way up to the temple to pray, and they're sitting at the gate of the temple, a man whom the Bible describes as being lame from the day he walked. He had never walked in his entire life. And he sat at the gate begging money of people as they came by. And every now and then folk would come by and on the way up to the temple drop a few gold and silver coins in his hand and then go on in the temple to pray. And when the service was over, they'd all walk out saying, my, wasn't that a good service? And they walked right on past the man, leaving him there. And the most anyone ever did was attempt to make the man comfortable in his misery. Nobody ever attempted to deliver the man from his misery. They just dropped a few gold and silver coins in his hand and said, God bless you. And they went up and prayed, and then they walked right on past him. And, and, and people are still doing that today. In the name of God, they're passing a lame world back and forth, back and forth. This occasion is Peter and John are on their way up to the praying man, sticks out his hands to beg money of them. And you remember those classic words. Silver and gold we do not have. We are broke. We have no money. But what we do have, we'd like to share it with you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And the man got up and walked. Now, try to understand what was coming down. What Peter and John were saying is that for three and a half years, we have lived our lives with a man who lived his life in total dependency upon his father. And if you remember what I've been saying, the unique thing about Jesus Christ was that Jesus Christ was the only man who ever lived who did absolutely nothing. He never healed the sick, never raised the dead. He never gave sight to the blind. He never performed any miracles. Jesus was the only man who ever lived who did absolutely nothing. Everything Jesus did, his father did it in him. And Jesus Christ himself said, that which I do, my father does it in me. I come only to do those things which please my father. And he, he constantly told the people who followed him, do not believe me simply because you see me performing miracles. Don't believe me because I'm healing the sick, raising the dead, and giving sight to the blind. I want you to believe me because the works that I do, my father is doing them in me. And if you ever see me do something that my father is not doing in me, then you don't have the right to believe me. But as long as I am doing what my father tells me to do, then you better believe me. That was the same kind of confidence that Paul had. 
That's why if you examine the life of Paul, the first thing impression you might get was that Paul was some kind of egotist. Because the guy stands up and talks about not the Lord. He says, my God will do this and my God will do that. And he doesn't come into town and says, I've come to preach the good news to you. I've come to preach the gospel. I've come to preach my gospel. And somebody would say, Paul, which way should we go? Paul says, follow me because I'm going that way. That's confidence. And that's essentially what Jesus laid on his own disciples. I am dependent on my father. And because I depend on my father, my father is available to me. And all the things I do, I do because he's available and because I'm dependent. Now, if you depend on me the same way that I depend on my father, I'll be available to you the same way my father is available to me. Now, Peter and John are saying is that we've watched him live that life. We are now dependent on him. And because we are dependent on him, he's available to us and has filled us with himself. Therefore, we tell you in his name, get up and walk. The man got up and walked. That is the essential of the Christian life. That to be a live model is to simply live your life in total dependency upon Jesus, the way Jesus lived his life in dependency upon his Father, and Jesus will be available to you the way his Father was available to him, and you will be able to go out in a crippled, blind, frustrated system, people who are bound, and liberate them in the name of Jesus. As the man got up and walked, the miracle of that healing spread throughout Jerusalem so that it became the talk of town. Everybody was talking about this man who was over 40 years of age, who had never walked in his entire life, who had gotten up and walked. And the word spread so much until the religious leaders in town got a little disturbed, keeping in mind that if you start producing a live model of what ought to be happening, and you start fleshing out a live model of what's happening in the heaven, the greatest opposition you will get might be from the religious establishment. Because nothing is more disturbed to a cold, dead, orthodox establishment than people who are alive. Because you become a threat to them. See, I, <clears throat> I'm threatened by people who are what I know I ought to be. Intimidated by them. I feel very comfortable in the presence of people whom I feel that I'm accomplishing more than they are. Very friendly. But when I get in the presence of people who are showing me myself, I get intimidated. And nothing is more intimidating to a religious establishment than to see people who are getting turned on to God and they didn't get turned on to God through their system. Because <laughs> it's much more comfortable to know that you got turned on to God and you're a member of my church and I can take credit for it. <laughs> But then to find out that you didn't get turned on to God, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like, um, I think it was um, Charles Finney, the great revivalist, who was preaching in a town one night. And when he got through preaching, this woman came up, you know, really weeping and she was really convicted by what was happening. And, and so Charles Finney walked up to her and says, my dear lady, <clears throat> what was it that I said tonight that really got to you? <clears throat> she said, nothing. <laughs> Well, I mean, obviously, the tears and the emotion says that there was something that I said in my message that really got to you. I mean, what was it? And she said, nothing. Well, then what are you uptight about? She says, well, as I walked through the door, the people who greeted me at the door showed me so much love until I said, I want to be like that. And that's what convicted me. Well, that's devastating, man. You mean I had nothing to do with it? No. <laughs> And so we all get intimidated. And so long comes the religious establishment to check out these guys, Peter and John. And the Bible says, the Bible says they came out to check them out. And in Acts chapter 4, verse 13 says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were ignorant and unlearned men, they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Their first reaction was that these are a bunch of ignoramuses. Look at them. They're dressed in sheepskin and goat clothing. They're not dressed in fine linen and purple the way we are. They don't even look aristocratic. They don't even look like, like us. They haven't been to our institutions of learning. They don't speak with a cultural accent. They don't show any signs of academic learning. Bunch of ignoramuses. The Bible says they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. The first evidence that one 
is fleshing out as a live model. What's happening in heaven is the fact that people who encounter you will perceive that you have been with Jesus. The life of Jesus will come through. And that's what it's all about. Now that was devastating because that was the same crowd who had gotten rid of Jesus. That was the same crowd who cried crucify him. That was the same crowd that had put Jesus to death. Now they had gotten word. Read these rumors and reports that Jesus Christ was supposed to be alive, at least that the grave was empty. Well, they chalked that up by saying that the disciples came and stole his body. They were not about to believe that Jesus Christ was alive. But now they looked at Peter and they saw Jesus. They looked at John and they saw Jesus. And that was devastating because the greatest argument for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not necessarily your ability to argue it academically or historically. Although those are very valid and must be in there. The greatest argument that Jesus Christ is alive is that he's coming through in your life. Those of us who are going to be fleshing out live models of what's happening in heaven, that is, that is the key to the whole thing. Jesus Christ ought to be coming through in your life. So that if I want some inkling of what Jesus Christ is like, I'm not at talking about perfection now, but if I want some inkling of what Jesus Christ is like, I should find it in you. That if I want to know something about the justice of Jesus, I ought to find it in the community of believers. If I want to know something about the love of Jesus, I ought to find it in the community of believers. That you become the vehicle through which Jesus expresses himself. So you don't go around telling people when people go to you and tell you about their needs, you don't sit down and say, well, let's pray, brother, that God will meet your needs. That's not what you do. You become the vehicle through which God meets that person's need. You become the instrument. These people have been with Jesus. And that is essentially what it means to be the live community. So that if people want to know where Jesus is and, and how Jesus is behaving, folk will be able to say, there they are right there, that community right over there. If you want to find out where Jesus is doing his thing, let me show you. And you become the model of what Jesus is doing. And this becomes, this is, this then becomes the witness. The witness is not necessarily that you go out and verbalize it all the time or that you stand up and preach all the time or you do what you call verbal witnessing, although that will be included. But the greatest witness that Jesus Christ is alive is that you have adopted a lifestyle through which he can produce himself and people are able to see Jesus coming through. These people have been with Jesus. And you see, the ability of Jesus to come through is not determined by you breaking your neck trying to produce the Christian life. Perhaps I can illustrate. Anybody got a handkerchief here? I like to use it. I'm a musician or magician. So. <clears throat> Nobody with a handkerchief. Right? Oh, there. Beautiful. There you go. Now, here's a handkerchief, see? And the whole idea is that I want that handkerchief to pick up that recorder. Okay? And that recorder is going to represent the Christian life, right? And a handkerchief represents you, right? So I say to the handkerchief, will you please pick up that recorder? doesn't move. <laughs> Say, of course not, Tom. It doesn't move because um, it didn't join the church yet. <laughs> so we take the handkerchief down to the nearest church, you know, and we have him meet with whoever's in charge of him getting in there. And they examine him and they say, well, he's a fine looking chap. Yeah, I, we'll let him join. So they, they get him to join the church. He becomes a member. Now that you're a member of the church, will you please pick up that recording? Still doesn't move. So of course not, Tom. He hasn't been baptized yet. <laughs> Everybody knows in order to be to pick up the recorder, he's got to be baptized. And so we we baptize him. You know, we take him and dunk him or sprinkle him or whichever way you want to do it. And we say, now that you have <clears throat> now that you have been baptized, will you please pick up that recorder? Still doesn't move. So of course not, Tom. <laughs> you know, he's got to learn the ways of the Christian church. I mean, there are things he doesn't know, you know, and we got to teach him before he can become a Christian, before he can pick up that recorder. So we put him in the special catechism class and we teach him. And he learns all the hymns and all the motions and he knows when to rise and when to kneel and when to stand and all that. <clears throat> That's just in case he can't read the program on Sunday. And, uh, <clears throat> and now that you've learned all those things, 
Now that you know how to do all those things, we give him an exam and he passes it with flying colors. We say, now that you've been through our whole instruction class, pick up that recorder. Still doesn't move. He said, no, Tom, you forgot something else. He's probably doing some very worldly things. And, you know, these worldly sinful things will keep a person from being Christian. So we got to stop him from doing those worldly things. So we go out and eliminate all these worldly things from his life, you know. We make him shave so he doesn't wear a beard anymore. Um, we get rid of her mini skirt and lower her dress three feet so it comes down to her floor. <laughs> we don't let her go to any more nightclubs or movies. Stop her from smoking and drinking. Now that you have gotten rid of all those worldly things, will you please pick up that recorder? Still doesn't move. He said, of course not, Tom. You've forgotten this one final important thing. There are liberal forces today moving against the Christian cause. And if these people are going to really be Christian, they've got to learn how to stand up for right and righteousness. And so we teach them to become a fighter, stand up for right and righteousness. We teach them to fight communism, the Catholic Church, the National, <laughs> the National Council of Churches. And we get them to join the Republican Party, which will put them three steps to heaven. Now that you are a fighter, now that you're against the National Council of Churches, you hate communists, you don't like Catholics, and you're a Republican, pick up that recorder. It still doesn't move. You know why? It's just a handkerchief. There's no life in that handkerchief. But if I take my hand, my hand's got life in it. And I run my hand through the handkerchief so that the hand becomes, the handkerchief becomes under the control of my hand. And then I walk over here and I pick it up. You notice that the handkerchief picked it up. And if I could lift up 200 pounds above my head and that handkerchief is on my hand, the handkerchief will pick up 200 pounds. In fact, whatever is possible to my hand is possible to that handkerchief as long as it's on my hand. Now Paul says, that's the way we are. Of myself, I can do nothing. That's me right there. I can do absolutely nothing. I'm just a handkerchief. There's no life in me. But through Christ, who has life, through Christ, who comes inside and strengthens me, I can do all things. And that's what you're talking about. That if you're talking about being like Jesus, it is not you going out, breaking your neck, trying to live the Christian life. Because a great number of people have the impression that the Christian life is one of carrying around in your pocket, you see, a bunch of rules and regulations. Don't do this. Stay away from that. Don't go near that. For God's sake, don't look at that. <laughs> and so you keep the rules and regulations nearby, you know, and you go out and you hold yourself real tight because we're going to be Christian. You never meet those nice, sanctimonious, spiritual people. They walk around, they have halos over their heads. And they go out holding themselves real tight because they're controlling themselves. And you go up and you say, hey man, what's wrong with you? You look like some kind of nut. <laughs> what do you mean? I'm no nut, I'm being spiritual. And they struggle, you know. And all of a sudden they feel themselves about ready to reach out and grab something. And they fight and they struggle. They say, wait, 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 hold it now. Just stay there, man. I got to check the rules to see if it's all right. Now stay there. Stay there, will you? <laughs> Rule number three says I can't touch you. Hey, come on now. Look, don't play around, man. This is serious business. Hey, look, I can't do that. The folk at church won't understand. Now, look, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be Christian now. Honestly, God, I'm trying. <laughs> No, no, don't, don't hit me yet, God. I'll try it. You know. Hey, look, man, come on, cooperate, will you? And you can weigh yourself out like that. I'm tired already. <laughs> and some of the most neurotic people I know are religious people trying to be Christian. You can break your neck that way. Because the Christian life is not your attempt to be like Jesus. It's not you going out trying to live up to his life because you can't. It's impossible to be like Jesus. If I gave you eight hours practice every day for the next 10 years to be exactly like the person sitting next to you, you think you could do it? And some of you saying, God forbid. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but you couldn't pull it off. You couldn't pull it off because you are two distinct human beings. 
There's no, there are no two human beings anywhere in the world like you. It's impossible for any one person to be like another person. If I gave you 10 hours practice for the next 20 years, you couldn't do it. Now, if you can't be like another human being, would you tell me how in all the world could you ever be like Jesus? Now, think about that. If you couldn't, through effort, be like another human being, how can you, through effort, be like Jesus? You can't. It's impossible. But you see, the excitement of the Christian life is that God doesn't require you to break your neck to be like Jesus. Jesus says, instead of you trying to be like me, why don't you let me come into your life and I will be myself through you? The word Christian is spelled C-H-R-I-S-T, Christ. I-A-N, Christ in you, living his own life through you without any help or assistance from you because God doesn't need your help to be God, just your availability. You see, we go around with this funny thing, poor helpless God, he can't quite make it without me, so I got to go out and help God, you know. Because after all, God helps those who help themselves. Second Hezekiah chapter 5, verse 40. <laughs> yeah, you know, and people honestly believe that. God helps those who help themselves. You cannot help yourself. In fact, it is the other way around. The scripture teaches God helps those who cannot help themselves and who see that they cannot help themselves. That's why Romans 5, 6 says, when we were without strength, helpless to help ourselves, Christ died. That God commended his love towards us that while we were sinners, while we were alienated, while we were the enemies of God, he died for us. God doesn't need your help to be God. I mean, like he made heaven and earth without you. God became a man in Christ without you, died on the cross without you, rose again from the dead without you. He doesn't need your help to be God. He needs your availability to be God through you. He wants your life to become the vehicle through which he expresses himself. And so the word gets around. Hey, there's some people I know. Man, they're like God in so many ways. That's what it's all about. Now, they're not talking about perfection now. Get, don't get that mixed up with perfection. Because once you get in that perfection kick, you'll, you'll go back to producing that austere kind of Christianity where everybody went around, you know, molded because we are trying to be like Jesus. And, uh, you know, you, you, you walk up to them and say, have a cigarette. And they don't know how to simply say, no, thank you. I'll have you know <laughs> that my body is the temple and dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And I do not, you know, just, <laughs> just say, no, thank you. <laughs> you know, they, they, they take you all through that whole thing, you know. That, and they think that that's being like God. Just be yourself and let God be himself in you. And, you know, they, and, and, and what happens is that you, if you do not allow the Holy Spirit to be himself, it'll put you into a false kind of piousness, you know. It's like, it's like, it's like these super puritanical people claiming to be filled with the Spirit, you know. And I, it reminded me, I was sitting at dinner with one of them one night, you know. And uh, we were in this restaurant in New York, you know, and, and we were sitting in, um, in, in Mama Leone's. And, and, you know, a lot of the, the theater people come in that particular time, you know, and also, so he was sitting, you know, and this guy's... I don't know what's, what's happening to people today. People getting so loose and, and you know, and uh, all these girls with these short dresses on, you know, are just, just disgraceful, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, and you know, the point is that these people act all this ultra thing and that is not God's bag. It's not God's bag at all. Especially girls got good looking legs, man. <laughs> But the point is that Jesus allows you. Now, let, let me stop on that point because I just spotted some of the super spiritual people in the audience. When I said that, that leg part, you frowned up because you see, to be spiritual, you're not supposed to say that, right? But let me say this. If I sat here and you, you're a female and I said, you have a very beautiful face. Yeah, and you'll sit and blush just like you're doing now. Yeah, you blush, see? Then I say, you have very beautiful legs and you don't know how to handle that but yet there are more of your legs than your face. <laughs> you see, we carry this false, stupid modesty around. And we don't know how to be ourselves because we've been programmed that that isn't spiritual. 
And if you didn't think it was spiritual, you wouldn't show them legs. <laughs> So, you know, what, what we're talking about is God wants, God wants honesty. And to be filled with the Holy Spirit is not going around with a false sense of modesty. It's allowing Jesus to be himself in you. And you don't go around breaking your neck. You just relax and let God be God. And then people will see Jesus. They will see Jesus. Well, Peter and John were arrested. And they were told, listen, if we ever catch you guys out on the streets talking about Jesus Christ anymore, you are dead. We will feed you, we will feed you to the lions. You are dead. And in verse 19 of Acts chapter 4, Peter and John answered, Peter answered and said, whether it is right before God to listen to you more than God, you judge that. But as for us, we cannot help but speak those things which we have seen and heard. In other words, what Peter and John were saying is, listen, you guys are the rulers of Jerusalem. You are the government. You are the authorities. And according to the law, you can tell us not to speak the name of Jesus anymore. But you ask yourself whether it is right that we listen to you more than God. Because God's told us to speak and you're telling us not to speak. You judge who we should listen to. But while you're judging, we can't help but speak. Now, you've got to read that verse, verse 19 of Acts chapter 4, to put, Corinth, to put Romans 13 into perspective. You see, a whole lot of you, when I've been talking about doing God's thing, come back with that Romans 13 bit. Well, the Bible says be subject to the higher authorities because they're ordained of God. And, you know, like, like for instance, many of you have said, look, I know that war is wrong. But if the government says for me to go out the war, the Bible does say to, to, to be subject to the high authorities. Now, if you're just going to read that one verse by itself, it's no good because you can't interpret the Bible by one verse. We have what is called the analogy of faith that is comparing Scripture with Scripture to arrive at a conclusion. If you're going to interpret the Bible, you must interpret the Bible by the Bible, by the whole Bible, not by one verse. Now, Peter and John were told by the government that you are not to mention the name Jesus anymore or you will be put to death. Peter and John are essentially saying, sorry, fellas, because we've got orders from God. In other words, you obey government up to the point that they ask you to violate the word of God. And then you've got to do what God tells you. The other thing, if you read clearly Romans 13, it says be subject to authority because authority is ordained of God. It doesn't mean that everybody in authority is ordained of God. And it doesn't mean that everybody who holds authority does what God wants them to do. The position of authority was ordained by God. But everybody who holds a position of authority may not be doing what God wants them to. And you've got to know that. The position of mother and father is ordained of God. That's an ordained God position. It doesn't mean that every mom and dad is doing what God's asking them to. And that's where you got to separate the difference between authority and those in authority. I must respect the position of authority. But whenever the people who are in authority are using their authority to violate the word of God, then I must go against them. And that's what Peter and John are saying. We respect your authority. That's why we've come here. But if you're telling us to do something that God has told us not to do, or you're telling us not to do something that God has told us to do, we've got to listen to God, friend. Sorry. That's why later on, you read, when they were arrested, they, after they let them go, they went back to the same spot they were where they were arrested and started preaching again. Now, that's anarchy. That's lawlessness. Those disciples were a bunch of anarchists. And they were so filled with lawlessness and anarchy that the authorities felt the only way to get rid of them was feed them to lions and nail them to crosses. And that's what they did. The most lawless anarchist group in the Roman Empire in the first century were Christians. Keep that in mind. A person who is filled with the Holy Spirit not only shows Christ, but he lives oblivious to public opinion. A person who is filled with the Holy Spirit lives oblivious to public opinion. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge, but we're going to do what God tells us. In other words, if there's a showdown between public opinion and what God wants, the guy does what God wants. But you see, that's where it's tough, because most of us need public opinion. Most of us, our egos are so weak, and we don't know who we are, that we need other people to determine who we are, and we allow our social acceptance, or the need for social acceptance, to determine what our philosophy will be. You ever go into a meeting, 
a group or something, and you're going to make a point of view and you've thought that thing out and you honestly believe that what you have to present is right, but as you sit down at the table, you look down at one end, and there's John sitting down there, and you say, I know that he's not going to like this position, and I want him to like me. He might not like me after I make this presentation. Man, I'd, I'd hate to be on the wrong side of him. Boy, and there's Sue sitting down there, and I've been trying to date her for the last month. And if I make this position, I know I'm going to turn her off. Wow. Well, I don't want to lose them. So you back off. And you don't do what you're supposed to do because you're afraid that you won't be accepted. And that's where our egos come in. We have the strong need to be accepted and we compromise the truth because we want to be liked. And there's got to be a point, you see, and that's where Jesus comes in. Jesus Christ will allow and create situations for your ego to be fed so that when you have to stand up for the truth, you stand up operating from a position of strength. Jesus knows you have needs. He knows you have a need to be accepted, and he will create for you atmospheres where you will be affirmed so that when you've got to stand up for the truth, you come into that situation with enough self-affirmation to be willing to lose whoever you must lose in order to stand for the truth. That's why you can't pull off this idealistic concept without Jesus, because we have these personality breakdowns that only Jesus Christ can affirm. And it was because it was because Peter and John belonged to a fellowship of believers who were affirming each other that Peter and John could stand up before the Sanhedrin council and accept their rejection because they knew that they belonged to a model of believers who would affirm them. That's why we need each other. And that's what God had in mind for the church. That's what the church was supposed to be about. So that if we've got this live model where we are affirming each other and meeting each other's needs and building each other up, when we've got to face an oppressive system, we can face them not needing their acceptance because we've got each other. We've got each other. And so it means that you've got enough self-affirmation not to be concerned about public opinion to stand for the truth. All of us have been victims of our parents in many ways who've laid that on us. When we've said, you know, mom, dad, I'd like to do something, so I said, well, honey, you know, I don't mind you doing it. It's what the neighbors will say. I don't have anything personally against it, but you know, the folks in the community would talk because people don't have the guts to be themselves. They worry about what people will say. Being filled with the life of Jesus Christ makes it possible for you to live oblivious to public opinion. So they let Peter and John go. And verse 23 of Acts 4 says, And when they were let go, they went back to their own company. They went back to the live model they belonged to. And they reported what had happened to them. Now, you see, on the way back, you see, there could have been this conversation. John could have turned to Peter on the way back and says, you know, Pete, you've always been the impulsive type. You know what I mean? The Lord had to get after you a couple of times about that. Remember, you always open your mouth out of turn, acting all bold and brash. And now, you've got to understand that, that, that the Lord ain't around now. And that these, these cats in the Sanhedrin Council, man, they, they tough brothers. You know, they, they can eliminate us. I mean, you know, and we're just a bunch of young preachers out of seminary, you know, and, and we're trying to, you know, we're trying to make our way, you know, and anybody that's going to make his way has got to work his way in the system and climb up to get in a position of power before he starts opening his mouth, man. And the best thing to do, Pete, is for us to get in with these cats. And we're starting out landing on them already, man. we got to be cool, you know, work our way in. And after we work our way in, we will have prostituted ourselves so much that we won't say anything. See, that's the danger of those folk who go around talking about we're going to work within the system. Well, to get in that system, to get enough power to be able to do something, you've got to play all kinds of games to get up there. And by that time, you've so prostituted yourself, you forgot what you got in there for. That conversation didn't occur. And when they got back, they reported what was said. And the word of God says, and when they heard that, that is when the fellowship of the live model heard what had happened. The Bible says they lifted up their voices to, with one accord. 
and begin to pray. Now, there could have been some discussion previous to that, but there was no discussion. They lifted up their voices to God with one accord, and here's what they prayed. They said, Lord, you are God who's made heaven and earth and the sea and everything that is. And they start praising God. Now, when you get a chance, check it out in your Bible. You will notice from verse 23 to verse 29 in Acts chapter 4, they never once mentioned their problem. They never got down and they said, oh God, we're threatened, you know. Because, you know, generally when most of us pray, the only time we ever pray is when we're saying, help! <laughs> they never once mentioned their problem. They began to praise God because a person who is filled with the life of Jesus Christ spends a lot of time praising God. A whole lot of time praising God. That's why if you read through the psalmist, man, constantly he's talking about the praise of the Lord shall continually be in my mouth. Or David closing out the psalms by saying, praise him on the cymbal, praise him on the harp, praise him with the trumpet, praise him with the psaltery, praise him on the high sounding cymbal. And when he ran out of all the instruments he could think of, then he said, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Because a person who is filled with the life of Jesus Christ spends much time worshiping God and praising him and reminding God of who he is. And they went on and they said, Lord, you are God who hath made heaven and earth. And when they said that, it dawned on them. I mean, like if you're the God who spoke the world into existence, and you're the God who upholds all things by the word of your power, then what is that puny Sanhedrin all about? <laughs> I mean, like if you put the world in existence, you can handle them. And then they began to pray. They quoted the second psalm. Who by the mouth of your servant David has said, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? In other words, they begin to remind themselves that this is not the first time that the demonic has raised his ugly heel against the people of God. And that's one of the things you've got to accept, that simply because you create a live model of what's happening in heaven doesn't mean it's going to be all cozy and that there aren't going to be forces moving in to try to destroy that. See, some of us think that by creating a live model of what the kingdom of God is supposed to be like, that, that we're going to have this beautiful paradise. And that nobody's going to try to obstruct it. Nobody's going to try to move in on us. But I keep telling you, you're dealing with the demonic. And he will try to move in on it. And he will try to destroy it. And he will always be trying to create tension and division even within that model. And don't think there's anything wrong with you because you become attacked by the demonic. And when they got through praying, in verse 29, after they reminded themselves of who God was, then they said, now, Lord, behold their threats. But grant unto your servants that with all boldness they may preach. In other words, they never asked God to remove the threats. They just said, Lord, look at the threats. And while you're looking at it, Lord, <laughs> give these cats who've got to go out there the boldness to lay it on them anyway. They never once asked God to remove the obstacle. And that's where many of us get hung up about being Christians. We think that when we pray, God's supposed to move all these obstacles out of our way. And God never promised to remove the obstacle. He promised to give you what it takes to go through it. To go through it. That's what it's all about. That is what it's all about. And then the Bible says, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. The place was shaken. And that's what happens when the fullness of the Spirit comes. People get shaken out of their complacency. And I'm not just talking about a building or physical trauma. I'm talking about we become shaken within ourselves. We get shaken out of our apathy and out of our insensitivity and our unconcern for each other. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak the word of God with boldness. And if you get a chance, go through the whole book of Acts. And every time you run into that phrase, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, you, won't find, you will find not too long after that, it was said, and they spoke. Or they were speaking. Because you see, speaking for Jesus follows being filled with the Spirit. That a person who is truly filled with the life of Jesus Christ will be speaking for Jesus. It doesn't mean you're always running around buttonholing people and stuff, but it means your whole lifestyle will speak for Jesus. And verse 32 says, And the multitude of those people who believed were one heart and one soul. 
And none of them said that that which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. The multitude of those people who believed were one heart and one soul. It means that the life, this community you're talking about, as you are filled with the life of Jesus Christ, you become one. You become committed to each other. There will be no divisions in that group. You will not be broken down on the basis of class, on the basis of class distinction or religious denominationalism. You will not allow to yourself to be broken down on the basis of economics or race or anything else. There will be no division among those people who become live models of the kingdom of God. And so in that fellowship, we don't label each other. We just simply become lovers of Jesus. And none of us will say that which we have is our own because once we become part of this live model, everything that all of us have become belongs to all of us. And we start sharing. And if, if we all agree that in this group that it is the will of God for us to be here in this community, then there will be nobody in that group who will have to drop out next semester because of financial difficulty because all of us will get together and bail them out because we're committed to each other. And what I have that somebody else's need, we will share it. We will become part of each other. Now that's what you're talking about. None of us will go around and say, that's mine, and no, no, no. If we're gonna live a live model, then what I have is yours, and what you have is mine and yours, and we all work it out. Then you're talking about the live model. Closing, you say, Tom, how do we produce that? How, do one, how does one get filled with the life of the full, how does one get filled with the Spirit of God? It's very simple. As Jesus Christ is allowed to be Lord of your life, you are filled with the Spirit. When they went out in the streets of Jerusalem that Pentecost day, 